Right, can you, can you hear me? Welcome, welcome everybody. Bienvenue to Le Monde. So, um, I'm going to be talking about a, uh, what I think is a sort of form of chaos today. Documentation. And uh, an idea which I had a while ago um, around how we could potentially improve the situation of documentation um, from, from my uh, motivation within Scala, but there's no reason anything I'm talking about today is particularly dependent on, on Scala. And I'm, I'm boldly proposing a documentation revolution. You can judge me on that afterwards, or maybe you can judge me on that in, uh, in, in five years to see if there was actually a, a revolution. Don't hold your breath, but I hope it is at least an interesting idea for you to, to think about. And uh, I hope that before long, there will be um, a realization of this idea, uh, which I'm calling a mock, um, that you'll be able to use. Uh, a mock, if you, if you don't know, is, a, is an English word that, that, that means um, a sort of chaotic, frenzied, um, disorganized. I think it's very appropriate for, for talking about documentation. Uh, now, this idea came about because I was thinking about my own challenges with documentation. Now, you maybe know I write quite a lot of libraries, and you maybe also know that they're not well documented in general. And I, I, I took a, an introspective look at myself and tried to answer the question as to why that was. And I've always felt that investing a lot of time in documentation that would very quickly get out of date or would be difficult to manage alongside the code was actually stopping me from putting the effort in to, to produce it. So I'd like to talk about a few different scenarios, different, different users who all have a need for documentation, and try to talk you through some of the problems they have. So scenario one. Uh, by the way, I, I, I'm going to mention these four scenarios. If, if you think any of them apply to you, uh, stick your hand up. So scenario one. You maintain an application in, in production with a complex tree of dependencies, you must respond to security notices if they affect you. Does anyone here have that sort of problem? So a few, a few people are responsible for, uh, for handling production applications. So what happens? Your dependencies are, are, are complex. It's actually quite a challenge for you to know if a new security <coughs> advice notice from the, uh, the author of a library actually affects your version. They may announce that there's a security hole, which existed in some range of versions, but it's not trivial for you to know whether that notice affects you. So there's a, there's a challenge there. It's not simply a matter of getting the answer straight away. Scenario two, you are an open source developer and you find a mistake in the API for someone else's library. How many people have been in this situation? And have you wanted to fix it? Not so many people wanted to fix it, but... Um, was the reason you didn't want to fix it because it's just too much work? There's too much difficulty to open the pull request? Is that sort of the, the, too, too much of a, a, a burden? So it is, it is somewhat difficult. And, and also, you probably know that if you're using anything but the most recent version, that your changes aren't going to be visible on the documentation for the version you're using. They will only be visible on the the latest version. So maybe there's less motivation for you to actually bother to make the change if it's not going to be realized by, uh, by, by people who are using the same version you are. Scenario three, you're the author of an open source library and you want to change the API. And what do you do? You, you decide to change the API, but not yet. Maybe six months time, maybe a year's time. You don't want to break everything for all of your users, so you want to give them some sort of notification in advance. So you can't change the API. You can't change it straight away. You can't just break code for everybody. So there's a, it's, it's causing delays and, uh, and, and, and um, making, making the, the whole uh, progress within uh, within evolution of libraries a little slower than it could be. Finally, scenario four, 
this one's the story of my life. <laughs> You've just finished writing a, a cool new library, but you haven't documented it yet. <laughs> what do you do? Do you release it without documentation? Or do you spend two weeks documenting it? Now, most of the time, I, I just release it. And then I never document it. Um, it's not entirely true of all my libraries. They're not, they're, they're not all that bad. But um, many of them, for me, it's more important to get it out of the door. But for other people, certainly if they have um, commercial users, I know that uh, Acker, for example, or even the Scala compiler, would not release the software, the code, the stuff you're going to run, unless the documentation is up to date as well. So the documentation is holding back the release. So what's common between all of these different scenarios? The issue that I see here is that old documentation is immutable. When you, when you have your documentation associated with your code, you publish the code, that documentation will never change. But that's very much not the nature of documentation. Documentation should include our experience that we learn over many, many weeks, months, and years. But instead, it's only the best knowledge we had about the code at the time the code was written. There's a big gap there between what we knew when we published the code and what we can know at any point in the future. And the documentation we do always happens at the, at the head of a branch. We're not, we're not really going back and changing old documentation. Or at least if we do, it's a very big challenge to, to make those changes. And there's other, other difficulties. The, um, the contribution workflows for uh, contributing documentation are, are typically... Um, that there should be lower barriers to making changes to documentation. If you change the documentation, no code breaks, nothing in production breaks. So we should be allowed to do that with much more flexibility than we can with changing code. We shouldn't need to have the same sort of depth of review on a pull request that changes the documentation as we do on code. Basically, documentation doesn't have enough independence from the code. Now, let's take a step back and try and answer this question, what is documentation? By documentation, I'm considering things like API docs, so Scala docs, Java docs, but also definitions, some, some words that you're going to use repeatedly in your documentation or your other documentation that define some concept. May include tutorials, an example of how to, how to um, do some example. Uh, it may include those examples themselves, the, 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 the source code that demonstrates some particular thing you want to show off in a tutorial. Uh, security notices I mentioned, this is a form of documentation. It's documentation that's almost guaranteed to be learned later. Uh, it may even be little details like what is the current best recommended version? This isn't necessarily the latest version. It might be a particular version with some amount of guaranteed support. Uh, and things like deprecation notices. Uh, we can also include in that the, 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 the boilerplate that goes into a Git repository that explains how to contribute and the license and so on. So all of this is, is documentation that we have to manage. Oh, and uh, blogs. So my proposal, in the general sense, is that documentation should be maintained independently of, by which I mean in a separate repository, but with reference to the repository we're documenting. I see a big problem that we keep our documentation generally in the same repository as our code when that documentation is documenting that same code. What this means is we can only really document the current state of the code. We can't go back and rewrite history. By separating the two, our documentation repository can evolve over time completely independently of the code, and the documentation repository can document all versions of the code. And the, the, the idea I'm going to explain is how that, how that actually works efficiently. But we can modify the entire history and get a snapshot of what is the, what is the documentation that is relevant for any particular commit hash in our code. This obviously requires new tooling. 
So whenever you write some documentation, whenever you write some, something which describes the code, I'm going to suggest that we put that in a separate repository, but we, we index it by the commit hash to which it refers. And everything downstream of that, everything downstream of that commit hash would have the same, would have access to that same documentation. So if you imagine a Git graph, at each of the nodes there may be little fragments of documentation. It might be a method, uh, an explanation of how a method works. It might be a, a definition of something. The commit that introduces that can have additional documentation attached to it. And everything downstream of that, every child of that, that commit hash would have access to that same, uh, that, that same documentation. This means we can, at any point, we can mutate our old documentation. We can add, append, improve the old documentation as we gain new information. And this, this much better reflects the actual discovery process of learning how our own software works, or how it works best, and sharing that. So my goal is to continue improving documentation, not just for the most recent version, which is what we do now, generally, but for all versions long after that code is released. And as a, as a secondary point, to, to, to lower the barriers for other users to, to contribute to that, code, uh, to that documentation. And the tool I'm proposing to do this is something called a mock. It is uh, designed as a low-level tool. Um, it's currently in development. It's not complete vaporware. I have got, I have got a, a working implementation of part of it, which will help us manage content which evolves over time. And the idea is that this, this wouldn't be entirely just a single tool that people use. It would be a platform upon which people can build their own applications and develop new and interesting ideas. There's a, there's a wealth of other uh, experiments and ideas going on in the documentation space at the moment, which are very exciting, uh, about how different documentation might be presented, how you can in, include graphs or things like that. A mock doesn't deal with that. It, it, it is a, a more of a low-level tool upon which that could be built. The facility that a mock provides is to give you the ability to mutate old documentation and to easily and uh, clearly understand how your entire body of documentation over history uh, evolves. So the architecture isn't particularly complicated. I have a database layer which is uh, effectively storing a storage layer which is, which is storing the, uh, the, 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 the metadata associated with, or the documentation that is associated with each commit hash and allows us to query, uh, to, to, be, to be queried to get a collection of documentation that is relevant for a particular commit hash. There is a linker which interprets URLs. Amok has URLs which allow us to refer uh, universally, well, uh, allows us to refer to a particular piece of content. And there is a presentation layer which will present the aggregated content in, in such a way that it's human readable. Now I'll, I'll talk about each of these in more detail. Um, there will also be a command line interface for, for basic interaction with, uh, with the database. So let's talk about metadata. Metadata is my general concept of a fragment of documentation. Each piece of metadata, each fragment, is a file, typically a text file. And we should store it, we should write it in a raw format. Now that typically means markdown rather than, say, a Word document. We worry later about how that raw format can be presented in such a way to be, to be pleasant, so that it, it looks nice in a web browser, looks nice on your console, or integrates interactively in your IDE. That's a, that's a later concern for the presentation layer. For now, we store it in, in the most raw format uh, we, we, we can. So some examples. The documentation for one method, that's one file, one piece of metadata, references a method in the source code and would describe it. So this would be one Scala doc comment, the equivalent, the equivalent of that. But not stored in the source code, 
stored separately, of course. We could have some benchmark results. If we generated a CSV file from um, JMH, for example, we could store that as documentation. It is a form of documentation. It is the performance of a particular uh, library or, or method within a library. A tutorial, that's maybe a longer piece of documentation, but it, it can go in, uh, uh, it can be a single file within a mock. Some example code. Now, this is actually not, not just text, but it's text which we hope will, excuse me, will, will compile. It might just be a one-line definition of a term or even, even something as simple as the project name just stored in a single file. This is all um, considered metadata. It would all be stored in a file in a mock. In that database layer. And because they're files, we can just store them in a, in a tree, just a standard hierarchy with some sort of structure. But... A tree that is beneath a commit hash. So we're using the file system to store this data. There's nothing fancy about it at all. The path to a piece of metadata that we, we use is um, it's going to be how we refer to it, but additionally, that will be beneath the directory that, that is the commit hash in the other repository that introduces that piece of metadata. And what the database layer can do is it can aggregate a whole series of commit hashes or the, the metadata from a whole series of commit hashes into a single tree to give us a presentation of the current snapshot of the documentation. You can pick any commit hash in your code repository, ask a mock to give you the snapshot of the documentation for that commit hash, and using the knowledge of the graph of commit hashes, the parents and, and, and so on, a mock will construct or give you a, a model view of the newly constructed tree that aggregates all of the, the history, picking the most recent versions that are correct for that commit hash. That can include branches which, which get merged and um, at, any, at any particular point, what we should have if the documentation is correct, is an accurate and correct snapshot. And if we don't, we can go and fix it. We can go and modify the documentation for the past. For We can move things between different commit hashes. We can terminate them after they, they're no longer relevant. These are all changes that could be made. Uh, I sort of explained this already. So let's look at an example of some metadata. I just made this up from um, one of my libraries, which does have some Scala doc comments, uh, contextual. Now, this is what I mean by the raw format markdown. This is describing a sealed trait in that library called static part. Uh, you can see there is an, an, a mock URL there which is referencing um, the code. You can see in the, in the, in the main paragraph, we, we have references to a definition for interpolation, a mock colon slash slash def slash interpolation. String is pointing to the API docs for java.lang.string. And then literal and whole are things that, that uh, contextual defines, and they are linked to the appropriate API doc docs for those. And then finally, there is an example under slash eg for how we might use uh, um, this, this, this uh, static part trait. So lots of references. What that means is that if any of those references change it, changes, if, if the definition for an interpolation changes, I change it once for the definition, and then a view of this content will automatically reflect that. So if I were to change that, def well, this is, this, is, this is maybe the, uh, the, the content of the metadata for describing an interpolation. Just one line, 
Uh, and even that refers to Java Lang string. But it will always use the most recent snapshot of the documentation for each of these links. So what I've shown you here is the content we're putting in. A little bit later, we'll see the sort of thing we will get out. All of this content is being put into a single universal namespace. It's being, it's being merged somehow. And we can have multiple Amok repositories all contributing to that namespace. Now, these would typically come from dependencies. So imagine you have a, a project, Contextual. I think Contextual has basically no dependencies of its own, but it does depend on the Java standard library. So we would maybe want to merge the Java standard library Amok repository. It's hypothetical, by the way. But the, the documentation for the Java standard library, merge that with the contextual one, which I'm describing here. And we end up with a single namespace that allows us to refer to API docs in either, uh, either project. They can point to different commit hashes or different, different versions. Um, and what seems sensible to me is that we, we would organize that by package name. So I think we already have to deal with package conflicts, class path conflicts in, uh, in our code. If we use the same scheme to store our documentation, then we're dealing with the same problem. So at least we, uh, we aggregate those two problems into one. I've mentioned things like API, um, EG was my example code, and other things. These I intend to be different applications. And on top of a mock, different applications can be provided, which offers some sort of um, semantic interpretation of the, of the metadata. So, for example, API docs would be expected to be in a certain format that includes the, uh, the, the signature at the top and maybe an explanation of what it does at the bottom. Benchmarks, we would maybe expect to be in a CSV format. And that's because an application would expect to read, those, uh, read, read the information, the documentation, in a particular way with a particular context. Applications go in their own namespace. So all the API docs will be under slash API. All the code examples will be under slash EG. All of the benchmarks will be under slash bench. So here are a few examples. We could have API docs. We could have security notices. If we want to include a security notice, we introduce it at the first version of the library that has the security problem at a path that is sec slash some name. And then we remove it we delete the content at the commit hash where it is fixed. Example code, go under EG, benchmarks under bench. Um, we could have metadata relating to the project, just the project name or the license it uses, things that we could, uh, we could use to fill in holes in a template, maybe a template you use for your boilerplate in, a Git, uh, in, your, in your Git repository. Uh, definitions, I think this is going to be a fundamental part of uh, uh, the sort of things we would like to document. Um, and then general markdown, such as a tutorial. All of these things can be stored, and they all have subtly different, uh, different purposes. Here's another more radical idea. We can actually store tests in an Amok database. Tests are themselves a form of executed documentation. What we do at the moment is we typically commit tests when we introduce a new feature or when we discover that something is broken. We introduce the test, we fix it. We're only adding tests at the end. We don't get the opportunity to backdate those tests and see whether older versions of the code worked or not. Now, generally, you don't want to run the tests if they, or you don't want the tests there if they don't even compile, but you can introduce the test as soon as it compiles. And then you can, you can run a test suite historically on older versions of the code and see what, see what the results are. You can get a better understanding of your code 
by backdating tests to older versions of it. I think this is an interesting opportunity. I'm, I'm, um, I mean, one, one particular usage of this that we already see in maybe, maybe a different, slightly different world from how most of us uh, work with computers, but um, browser development. You will often see people writing browser tests that check whether a certain CSS feature is implemented. Those, those tests are written by a third party, which um, then goes and tests them against all, all a grand history of previous versions of um, five or six different browsers, and gets a, a big set of results to see if they work or not. That's something we could all do. We could all take advantage of, potentially. So I'm, I'm just going to have this one slide on, on testing, leave that as an idea for people to explore further. So let's have a look at the implementation. Uh, it is implemented. It does work for uh, simple repositories. And there's an asterisk next to simple um, because most repositories are complex. In, in, in particular, anything which... Uh, the, 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 the complexity is actually relating to um, merge conflicts. So if you, if you have... Well, let me, let me, let me do the, uh, the demo. It's actually only 150 lines of code. But imagine we have a, a simple Git uh, graph here. So we're, um, there's no arrows here, but if you imagine going from left to right, from yellow to, uh, to orange, we branch. And when we branch, we, we add some API docs to the commit hash uh, at the path API slash X. I've just made it a simple path, but something, some API documentation gets added at that node there. And then two commits later, we add some more. Now, this is consistent as far as the mock is concerned. It means that if you went for the, if you went for this, uh, if you asked for the documentation at this commit hash here, you would get what was provided here. Same is true if you asked for the, uh, the, the metadata at this node. If you ask for the metadata at this node, or this node, or this node, you would get this version here. If you ask for the metadata here, we don't know if it actually exists. Maybe you get nothing, uh, or maybe there was something added earlier on. So it'll always give you the most recent version. We can happily merge metadata added on one branch and another branch as long as they don't conflict. So we've added x here, we've added y here. Um, down here, you wouldn't be able to see X, of course. You'd have to wait for the merge before you can see both X and Y. But everywhere thereafter, you'd get those versions. Uh, this is a scenario which is a problem, because we've added metadata at this node and this node on separate branches, and we're going to try and merge them here. This is something that requires resolution of the merge. And this is something which a mock um, uh, requires to be done, otherwise a, the, the, there, is a, there is a conflict. It doesn't know which one, which one to show. And you can fix it by adding uh, the content at this node as well, at the merge node. And that is, then, that is then consistent. And this generalizes to more complex graphs. But that's, that's the basic idea. We do have a problem, though, if we, if we start messing around with rebasing and squashing. Because that changes commit hashes. And if you remember, all of this content is stored in directories that are named after the commit hash. So if that commit hash changes, we've now got orphan nodes that we want to reassociate with the, uh, with the new ones that we've rebased. This is maybe one of the biggest challenges. I think that well, my best solution at the moment is to use a git rewrite hook that happens after the rebase or the squash and to rewrite those, those commit hashes. That, that works fine, as long as you're managing the source code and the documentation together. And I think if you are doing rebases, or if, if you are rebasing and you know you've added content, then you should probably be careful to make sure you do that. Um, but it's not as foolproof as I would like. Um, I may offer some sort of... Uh, um, fallback solution that will at least push the content up to one of its parent nodes 
uh, if, that's, if that's possible. But it remains to be seen how much of a problem this will be in practice. I think, in general, it, it shouldn't be too difficult. It shouldn't happen too often. There's also the opportunity of having multiple branches in our a mock repository. You may have noticed that, um, despite a lot of evidence, English is not the only language. And some people will prefer to have their documentation in, in, in other languages. Um, particularly Japanese and uh, Chinese are, are um, popular for requiring translations. Um, but there's no reason why we couldn't have more. And I think, I think this would be something that could be implemented with Git branches. We just branch our uh, repositories, our mock repository, and translators would, would make the translation of all of the metadata. And then whenever there's a, a, a change, pulling from the main branch, the English branch typically, would result in merge conflicts which would have to be fixed. And that's translation changes that would need to be made. So let's talk a little bit about the presentation layer. We will be presenting our raw content in some form that is nice and pleasant to use for, for users. Possible ways of doing this are as HTML. We could either just spit out the HTML to the console, or we could we'd actually run a web server and serve it. That would, that would be uh, certainly possible. Or maybe just as a link to an external resource. We could always output the raw format, or we could convert the markdown into something that's a little bit more readable on, on the console, um, a bit like uh, man on, on Linux does, but better. And um, we could also have integration with an IDE, for example. This would be, uh, this would be possible. And it could, could even be more interactive with, with a, a rich IDE experience. So how does that presentation layer work? You saw with the examples I showed you before that I had references to a mock URLs. And when I, when I went and looked at where that URL was pointed to, that had a reference to another one. So the presentation layer will actually go and recursively follow all of these URLs. And it will either link to them or actually embed their content within the, uh, within the markdown or whatever, whatever format it, it is. And there is some amount of translation that will take place in, in that process. Certain kinds of me metadata will be viewable in certain formats. It'll typically be um, HTML or, or uh, Markdown or uh, just plain text. Um, but it could include other things as well. And not all kinds of, uh, not all applications will provide all different, different formats. This is not so well defined yet. But essentially, what I want to do is to be able to resolve references and present them in a neatly embedded and uh, pleasant, pleasant to read, pleasant to use format. Maybe you're, maybe you're wondering why I'm here not talking about Fury. Um, or why it's taken me this long, at least. Maybe you're wondering why I haven't finished Fury yet. Fury's doing quite well at the moment, and um, the idea for a mock actually arose as a consequence of what I realized was available to me through Fury. Fury is a dependency manager and a build tool, but it's the fact it's a dependency manager which knows about source dependencies. It knows the external repositories it's using and the commit hashes of the source code that is used for each one. That happens to be precisely the information that a mock needs in order to aggregate together a set of, um, uh, a set, a set of documentation that is consistent, coherent, and very much a snapshot that is precisely the right version of the, the documentation that corresponds to your build. That's the magic. Fury knows exactly which version of the source code you're, you're using, because it has to depend on that source code. Using that information, a mock will therefore know 
all of the documentation, as long as it's got corresponding AMOC repositories for each, uh, each dependency, each recursive dependency, AMOC then has everything it needs to compose together a tree within a single namespace that is a snapshot that is uniquely configured for your build and accurate and, and in theory precise. And if it's not precise, you can go and fix it. But all the information is there and it should be consistent. So this is, this is my... Um, this is my dream, this is my vision. If each project has an associated documentation repository, Fury can combine the documentation from multiple different AMOC databases or repositories to produce a definitive snapshot of the documentation that relates to the exact code being built, all fully linked and embedded as necessary. That means we don't have to be hunting through web pages that have maybe more recent documentation than the one we're using or maybe aren't linked correctly, the snapshot we construct, or the snapshot that a mock constructs, should manage that for us. This is intended to be, this, this is a little bit hypothetical, but uh, this is intended to be how you would maybe interact with, or how Fury would interact with a mock. The first line there, we're going to add an mock repository, so just using a GitHub URL, uh, to an existing repository that's set up in, in a build. So we're going to add the uh, documentation repository to my contextual project, or my, my repository for contextual, um, and that will be github uh, propensive slash contextual dot amok dot git. And then once I've done that, Fury will go and pull in that repository, and it will have all the documentation, not just for the latest version of Contextual, it will have all the documentation for all versions, but it will know, because it knows which commit hash of Contextual it's using in this build, it'll know which one it needs to use to get the snapshot of the correct documentation. We can then run a command, fury doc read, which will give us the API documentation for this, this trait. Uh, contextual.static part. And by all means, you can get tab completion on that. So you can just tab your way through to the, 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 the class trait method or whatever that you want to, want to access. Um, I've added the dash dash raw flag here to, to show you what the raw output would look like. And that is exactly what we put in. But if you were to ask without that raw flag, what a mock or what Fury might do is present that in a way that's very convenient for you to view on your, on your console. The links have been replaced by short hashes. Now these are the shortest possible hash that uniquely identifies any piece of content. So it might be one character, it might be four characters, it probably won't be more than that unless you've got a huge database. And you can use a mock to look up this content directly, just by specifying the three characters there. The reference to the, the example code here, which I can't seem to highlight, that has been substituted in. It's no longer an embedded link. It is the, the actual content, because the presentation layer went and recursively fetched that and, and put it in there. And um, it's all very readable, um, very concise. doesn't give us more than we need. And um, this is... Uh, an example of how this might look on the console. You can imagine this might look uh, nicely formatted in a, in a web browser. We could add, add syntax highlighting and, and, and so on. So there's lots of, lots of possibilities there. So let's look back at those four scenarios. How am I doing for time? I've got 10 minutes. Okay. I'll have time for questions at the end because I'll finish in five. So you're maintaining this application in production with a complex tree of dependencies you must respond to security notices if they affect you. Well, you just run this command and it tells you what's relevant. That's it. If, there's, if there are any security notices, then you get a list. It lists everything that's in that sec directory for your current build, for your current context. If it's empty, great. If there's something listed there, then you probably need to go and change the, 
the version of the dependency you're using. You're an open source developer and you find a mistake in the API documentation for somebody else's library. Well, you can just edit the content. You maybe even want to specify uh, a version up here that is the version or the first version for which you, the, 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 the mistake happened. Maybe this would be an additional parameter, but you can run this command, you get a, a, an editor up, you go and change the file, and then inside the mock repository, you commit it and you create a pull request. I'm, I'm using the example here of a, a hub command, which uh, connects with GitHub, but essentially it, it could be this simple. Uh, maybe it's a little bit harder than I would like, but the, the ease, the, the facility of doing this is actually two-sided because the person who maintains that mock repository on the other side, who, who will be reviewing your PR, they know that you can't possibly break the code. They can probably click, they can probably do a very quick scan of the, the text and assume, have a bias for merging without really checking it in any detail. Because unless, it's, unless you've submitted a garbage pull request, it's probably going to be fine. It's probably going to be an improvement. There is a much lower barrier, or there can be a much lower barrier, for anyone merging a pull request relating to documentation. Scenario three, you're the author of an open source library and you want to change the API. Well, just change it. Change the, change the documentation. But you can actually tell people who are using older versions that from the current version onwards, it's going to change. You could add something using this hypothetical uh, deprecation application. And we could, we could edit this to say from version 3.1 onwards, this API will be, will be changing. Um, make, your, make your plans for how you're going to migrate. And it means that the head of the development can, can proceed faster. We can get changes in quicker without really worrying so much about notifying users of older versions that the upgrades are coming, that the changes are coming. That doesn't completely trivialize the, uh, the, the, the problem of managing users and their expectations, but it is uh, something which will, will help things uh, from the current, current status. And finally, you've just finished writing a, a cool new library, but you haven't documented it yet. Just release it. There's nothing stopping you now because the documentation can always be added later. That one's the easiest one of all. You don't even have to be the person who documents it yourself. Somebody else can contribute to the, the corresponding amok. Well, I mean, I would love, I would love people to um, <laughs> document my libraries for me. Um, so where do I go from here? Well, the first, the first thing, obviously, is to, to finish off uh, a mock. Uh, like I say, the, the, the database layer is a proof of concept. It, it, it works for simple cases. It can be made to work for more complex cases. And then the, the linker and uh, presentation layer actually aren't so, aren't so challenging. They're more straightforward. They're doing less radical things. It's the database where the complexity is. So I'm not too... Um, unhappy about where things are at the moment. I think this is... Uh, um, the difficult bits have been done. Or one of the difficult bits have been, has been done. The, uh, um, another one hasn't. But um, that's looking pretty good. And then what I want to do is use it to document Fury, which is continually evolving. And I, I have been reluctant to write documentation for Fury, knowing that I have changes planned. Why do I want to spend time documenting the current way it works when I know already how the next version will work? Well, I can do both. I can document the current version. I can document the new version. And both can exist. And whichever version anyone is using, they can get whatever is the current, for, uh, current state of documentation for them. So that's is everything I have.
I would love to hear questions about this. Um, so, yeah, is, is there a roaming mic or? Thank you, John. Uh, I, I have two questions, if I may be so bold. Okay. Um, do, 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 do them one at a time, otherwise I'll forget. Uh, yeah, well. My first question is, you showed the uh, documentation uh, in a mock format. Where is it coming from, those links? How do we create them? And the second question is, what happens with Java docs if they already exist? Are they in any way useful to a mock? Right, OK. Thank you. So the, uh, the first question, where are the links coming from? Um, some people would write them by hand. Um, other people would... Um, we, we, we could have some tooling which generates them automatically from uh, other, other, other places. Um, maybe, maybe IDEs could provide uh, some help there. You could, you could maybe right-click on a, a method name and, and copy, copy link to method, and then you could just paste that into the code. Oh, sorry, into the markdown, should I say. Um, typically, I would write that, all that by hand. Um, I didn't mention, but we could have some sort of checking layer that, 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 that checks that links resolve. Um, that's kind of difficult to do when we're composing different or aggregating different repositories, some of which may, may work, others don't. But, but this, is, this is always something that can be uh, iteratively uh, fixed, repaired, uh, and made more consistent. Um, and we could have ways of... Uh, handling the cases where the links are not correct, that, that, that don't just break everything. Uh, your second question is, how can we use existing Scala docs and Java docs? This is something that uh, a compiler plugin could um, automatically generate. So if, you, um, if you've ever looked at the internals of Scala doc, it runs the Scala compiler, and at some phase, it uses the, uh, the, the, the comments that are in the code to um, generate HTML. Now, instead of generating HTML, what that could do instead is to put data in the appropriate place in the AMOC database corresponding to the commit hash and uh, f extracting from the source code uh, the, the, the appropriate text as, as just a metadata file that, that, that goes in there. Um, and then you could, you could potentially run that overnight on every commit hash if you wanted to. And um, a later version of a mock would, would be able to identify that two versions are actually identical and that it doesn't need to store it twice. Um, that, that's, that's how I would imagine it working. I would be tempted to try something like that with uh, Scala 3. My, ap my appetite for writing Scala 2 uh, compiler plugins is limited these days um, but but I mean it, it's within within our capabilities yeah question at the and then then five rows back next hi thank you um, my question is uh, around scoping in sprints and so how would you do you think and how would you convince a PO to um, to implement documentation into the scope of a sprint. Um, you mentioned you haven't documented Fury. Uh, you, you choose to release rather than spend two weeks documenting, and that's all about time yeah. and money. So how would you go about convincing a PO to implement it? Pardon. So uh, I think um, it, it just doesn't matter, because the documentation can now be done at any time, in theory. So. The, 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 the exact goal of this is to separate um, the dependency between documentation and code. Um, how would I convince the, 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 the PO? I, I suppose if, 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 the, if there is some pain in the team, such as, such as I've been describing, where um, there is a challenge getting documentation out to the people who need to read it, and releases are being held back because the documentation isn't ready. I would sort of play on that, 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 that pain um, and, and say, 
well, just give up on documentation and let that happen as a separate process, you can even have a different team of people. So some people are full-time uh, code documenters. And I, 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 I value such people. I don't, I've never met one, but, <laughs> but they, they, do, they do exist. And um, th it could be their role to simply document the code and document all versions of it rather than just the most recent version. Um, I don't feel like I've answered the question well. Did, did it... Yeah, yeah. I think does anyone does anyone else here um, prefer implementing new f well writing documentation to implementing new features uh, like even slightly. I, I think I think there's not a single person here uh, because we're all primarily developers. We want we want to see we want to see the code being used. It's more exciting for us to to realise that someone ran our code and it did something, rather than they just read our documentation and they... Can I, can I just hold this to ask the audience a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Does anyone here think that this would encourage them to write more documentation? <laughs> <laughs> so so if, you, if you didn't hear, would, would a mock, if it existed in, a, in a, like a fully working and reliable form, would it encourage you to write more documentation? So... A few people. It doesn't need many people to write documentation. As long as a few people are doing it, they can do it for they can do it for all projects. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Well, one last question. Hi, Tom. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, since you said that um, Amok was going to be a low-level tool, uh, do you expect it to only work for the Scala slash Java environment, or do you expect that it is going to take off in other Ecosystems, uh, for example, you mentioned that um, uh, entities would um, would be documented uh, by a package path or whatever. I don't remember exactly what you said, but for example, if I take a, I don't know an npm package, uh, this wouldn't be something that would work. This would be very ecosystem specific. How would you think this is going to ev evolve in the future? So, so that's that's a really good question. Um, I've designed it with the JVM in mind, because this is what I work on. But there's, there's nothing that's particularly um, specific to the JVM in, in the tool. Uh, so it would be applicable in a JavaScript world as well. If NPM could provide the, the, the set of commit hashes of, of repositories corresponding to all of the dependencies it, it, it pulls together. I mentioned using package name as a, as a namespace because that's a very convenient way to, um, to uh, combine the, the, the potential conflicts on our class path with potential conflicts in, um, or I, should, I, should, I should say, resolve class path conflicts and documentation conflicts at the same time. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't use another namespacing scheme as well. There might be problems if you, are having, you, you have documentation for projects which combine dependencies both in the JVM world and in like another, another world that, that use a, a similar, or that, that maybe have the same namespace. Um, and the class path is no longer providing a, I don't want to call it a safety net, but a canary rather, that there is a, there is a conflict. Um, but it would be possible, yeah. And um, yeah, I think you, 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 you phrased the question, do I expect it to take off? I, no, but um, I, I, would, I, I think it's an interesting experiment which I would like to encourage people to use and discover whether it's something that could take off. Uh, yeah, I don't want to be too bold to say that everybody should use this straight away, but uh, I'd be flattered if you tried it. Do we have time for... No, we're done, so thank you for listening.